Hey everyone, welcome. I'm joined today by Rebecca Eckstein, uh, one of the Curtis Strategy consultants. Uh, today we're going to talk a little bit about higher education. Rebecca, I appreciate you joining. Sure. Good um, to be so, here. Rebecca, give us a little bit of a background here. Like, what, what, we're, we're, we're coming out of COVID. Higher education has been um, dramatically impacted by COVID-19. You know, what's going to be the biggest challenges for colleges this fall? Well, I think it's going to be organization and realigning their teams. You know, we are only as good as our best engaged team. Uh, senior leaders need to focus on their new vision uh, for moving forward, whether it be 100% on campus or a hybrid solution. You know, some are choosing different options, but they need to be clear on their priorities because they need to make sure that the community knows what their expectations are. Small colleges, for instance, who talk about offering personal attention. They're gonna to need to keep doing that or they're gonna lose market share. And it's hard to continually to engage students via Zoom for long periods of time. So I think they almost have to come back to campus in some form. Um, the students are missing an experience and they want that experience. That's what they truly want. Um, access to community partners will also be difficult because even if the college comes back, that doesn't mean the high school in the neighborhood came back or their community colleges. And they're going to have to re-employ their passion and their drive. Mm -hmm. It's going to hard. It's going to be hard. You know, some of these staff members that I'm talking to, they're tired. So in the beginning, it's going to be like Mondays all over again. And we all know how Mondays are. They're kind of tough. Um, in a recent survey by college presidents, 74 um, percent in a published document from Inside Higher Ed said that they needed foundational changes in their programs or they needed a new business model. And that's gonna create massive change for staff and faculty. So we've gotta put on our adventure you know, mindset and be ready for that change. And sometimes that's hard for some people. Yeah, for sure. I like that yeah. piece about, um, you know, talk about the student experience being a differentiating factor. It'd be right. interesting to see how you can build strategy around that. Exactly, exactly. So Eric, how, how do you recommend that colleges and universities reorganize after COVID-19. I know you've got some great ideas. Uh, yeah, so they've been, uh, you know, dram dramatically impacted. And I think the first thing to take a look at is whether or not their current strategic plan going into COVID is, is still relevant, or if that has been kind of, you know, uh, to totally disrupted and something that they just need to throw out and start thinking fresh um, uh, and bringing in fresh ideas. So I think, you know, one of the ways to do that is just assess where they're at uh, and then, and then you know, mm -hmm. use the strategic plan uh, to, to, to see if that is still a valid document. If it's not, you've got some serious things to consider. Um, not only that, short timeframes to do it can't do these long drawn out process, it, it processes. It, it needs to be a much more agile and dynamic planning uh, process. I think, you know, gone are the days of doing 12 month strategic plans and, and having the time to engage everybody. It needs to be a much more agile process that evolves over time as you're doing it. Because there, you're, you're right, the business models are changing in higher ed. And so how, how is that gonna impact certain schools? Well, they may be struggling with you know, their future and determining what's the best model to go forward. And there's a lot of different things to consider when doing that. Not only the model itself, but the staffing needs mm -hmm. of these organizations have dramatically changed. If you think of how far we've been pushed to adapt to new technologies or relying on our technological infrastructure, um, some, of the, some of the skill sets that may be needed are going to be different uh, or new to the organization from a capacity standpoint. But I think when it comes down to it is organizations need to get a little bit more hyper-focused. Mm -hmm. some, some of the plans that we've seen are, you know, they're big goals, but they're, they're kind of vague and they could be goals that would be on anybody's strategic plan. You know, so how are organizations making themselves unique? How are they differentiating in the market? And I think if they shrink the size of that focus and change down, they'll be able to implement and execute much more effectively because part of their success is going to be the ability to drive change. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ac academia has, has a lot of 
history and a lot of legacy that you know is not going to survive in future models. And so how do you go from that non-dynamic uh, culture and infrastructure to something that's much more flexible and adaptable and reactive to where the market is today and where it's going in the very, very short future? Sure, sure, I agree, yep. You know, and I know your mission, it's been about helping schools achieve their enrollment goals, right? And enrollment's a huge part of strategic planning. So, you know, the plan is about trying to achieve those goals in a short period of time that are gonna make a positive impact for the school. And with enrollment being part of that, like, you know, how do colleges win at the enrollment game today or the revenue game today? Well, you know, I think you hit on it when you said something about agile and working quickly, speeding up the process, because I think that the colleges that pivoted quickly last year in March, in fact, I was working at one and, and we had to pivot to a virtual platform in six days and we did it. Six so days, colleges, wow, that's, that's six light days. speed. Well, we had, to, we had to do it because we already had an event planned and it was supposed to be on campus. So we had to move the on-campus event to a virtual event. And then we had to figure all of that technology out and get everyone on board. And that was difficult, but we did it. And I think that the other schools I've talked to recently who pivoted quickly like that, um, they learned faster than their competition. And sometimes that's the only way to make it happen. And they were successful with their enrollments because they could pivot. So now the schools that can pivot back quickly, you know, don't take six months to figure out how to get back. You know, if you can pivot in two weeks off campus, you should be able to pivot back. Um, and those, those schools were, they excelled. They really did. The other thing is I think we're going to have to be creative this year. We're going to have to try new things. We're going to have to take some risks. We really are. And then I think to win in enrollment, the biggest, there's no magic bullet, honestly, but the biggest magic bullet that I've found is, well, you have to be persistent. You have to stick with it. You can't give up in May or June or July, but you have to track everything. Mm -hmm. You know, the things that you track improve. When you place the focus on data, analyzing and assessing the current state and your historical context, you can see areas for improvement. And then once you find the areas for improvement, then you're on the right track. And then lastly, marketing, you know, multi-channel marketing to reach all the target audiences is essential, um, not only to recruit this class, but future students. Um, older methods of reaching students are just not, um, they're, they're somewhat ignored now. Mm -hmm. um, how many emails do you get that you just can't get through in your email box? But new things like geofencing, retargeting, mobile footprinting, they're becoming the new ways to find students. Um, and you want to engage with not just this class, but few, you know, previous classes. You, right now, we should be talking to juniors and sophomores to get to fill those funnels for the next um, market, which is yeah. it's essential. It really is. So, so Eric, um, how do you think schools should compete in this landscape? I mean, that's how I think we should. But how, what do you think? I, I, I think it, it, it's a good question because the landscape was changing competitively, mm -hmm. but COVID made those exponential jumps. I think schools, universities need to acknowledge that there's a new level of competition. There's new players in the game, mm -hmm. right? You've got folks like Microsoft, LinkedIn Learning. Mm -hmm. They're gonna mm -hmm. be disruptive in the future. And you have mm -hmm. other online um, uh, platforms, online solutions, offering education, but maybe they're offering it in a niche area, right. a very particular area. So it's not the broad base, higher ed uh, model of learning. And so now you have to worry about death by a thousand paper cuts, mm -hmm. right? If you've got a thousand niche players out there, right? You have a thousand small concerns. Well, that, that will erode your market mm -hmm. eventually. Um, I think the other thing that schools need to, to, to get a grasp on is there's no geographical boundary in the digital landscape. Right. So that's important from who my competition is because now my competition's global, mm -hmm. right? If I'm in the online yeah. space. Yeah. And so how do I differentiate that online space to my, my, my teaching in person space? Mm -hmm. But you mentioned marketing. I think 
marketing is going to become one of the most important weapons mm -hmm. in the toolkit of schools to survive. Right. Because now they have to position a brand mm -hmm. in a digital landscape and ensure that that's going to get the eyeballs and relevance in that digital world. Mm -hmm. And then positioning that brand in some way, shape or form that's going to stand out from all the noise. Right. Like if you think of all these schools yeah. uh, trying to acquire students, how are they positioning themselves? What's their unique niche, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so some of the schools that, that we've worked with, you know, they're known for a couple things. You know, if you were to ask their alumni base, hey, you know, what's our school really known for? What do you see, see the most in the news for? It's probably a couple particular areas of study. Right. So why not own those spaces? Mm -hmm. Why not become the best in those few areas and go really deep with investment and strategy in that to own that niche, All right? And I think niching out in certain areas is going to be a value add because it will help as a catalyst to the brand, but not only that, expose the other programs and curriculum that the school has. Right. Um, right. But when you, know, when you have competition, one of the ways that you can survive is, is through partnerships, whether those partnerships are with employers or whether mm -hmm. they're with other schools, mm -hmm. right? And thinking creatively about how to structure those partnerships. Mm -hmm. right. But I do think one advantage competitively that seems to be coming up recently that, that I didn't think was gonna be maybe as big of an issue as it could be are the way states are handling COVID-19. So if certain states don't come out of lockdown and restriction, mm -hmm. that gives a competitive advantage to other schools in other regions. Mm -hmm. And so being in a particular state may actually be a competitive advantage in the enrollment field. Right. And so how can you as a president or board of directors advocate to the state to ensure that you're not part of one of those uh, that may be you know, late to the game Mm -hmm. in opening the door back up because that may dramatically um, affect enrollment. Mm -hmm. It absolutely will. It will. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's the, the, the marketing game, I think, is going to be a, a fairly significant one. Right. Um, so, you know, when you're working with clients, Rebecca, you know, what are you typically doing to, you know, maximize their, their strengths and, and, you know, help them compete in this landscape? Sure. Well, I'll tell you, um, you know, it's funny, you know, most people think I only work with a small college. That's not necessarily true. It really isn't. Um, because everybody's got a challenge right now. Of course. So, so I'm working with small colleges and large universities, the smaller colleges, of course, they have an immediate problem and it's front facing and they know what it is, but the, the larger universities, they may have a problem just in their one school or just in their one program. Um, I'm working with one school right now, for instance, and they, their education, school of education is declining. And you wouldn't think that that is happening, but it's been declining for a little while. And then another college is struggling with enrollment in their newest major. They added a major and they're struggling to get applications in the new major. So again, I say it comes back to marketing and you've got to track what's working. Um, tracking inquiries to graduation, that is a big deal. Schools will track inquiries to apps and apps to admits, completed apps, but to graduation, that's where you want to go. And then you want to know what the outcomes are of those students. Because if you can showcase to parents and students the outcomes of your students, they're graduating in four years, and hey, here, look what they're doing. That's when you can show a sustainable story. And what you need to do is create those stories. If you can make those stories and market those stories, programs will just be sustainable and, and, and reimagined um, for families. You know, families want to envision that experience and where will I be in four years, you know? So if you have internships, you wanna make sure you let them know that. And, and where will they be? If you can show the outcomes, the, the grad rates, the placement rates, um, the salary rates on pay scale, that's really important. Um, and, and all kinds of shifts can happen internally to make that happen. 
You know, maybe you have to combine the department. Maybe you combine marketing and enrollment. Maybe you combine enrollment and financial aid. Maybe you combine all three of them so that you cut down the silos and they're all talking to each other to provide that customer service to the student that they need. That's really important as well. Customer service, families want it now, right now. Um, they don't want it tomorrow, 24 hours from now. And if you don't have anybody on the phone, answering the phone, um, it's gonna be tough. Um, some schools are merging, acquiring other schools. And, and a few schools just in this last week have announced they're closing. And that's unfortunate, but um, it shows everyone the crisis that we're having in higher education. And 21% of our, in that same report I, I talked about a minute ago, 21% of our college presidents say that their staff and faculty are not ready for change. That's almost a quarter of their base. That's They're not ready guy. for change. Yeah. So it's, it's tough. It, it's really tough. Um, but like I said before, there's really not a magic bullet. It's about tracking, it's marketing, it's managing and it's persistence and keeping your team aligned and engaged. They've got to all be, I mean, you can't do it by yourself. A vice president of enrollment or a president or a CFO, they can't do it by themselves. They've got to have a team that is ready to go and driven. It's, mm -hmm. it's going to be paramount this fall. Sure. Yeah, that's, that, that's a scary place. And that's a scary statistic to hear about change. Yes, yeah. So Eric, I touched a little bit on mergers and acquisitions just a second ago, and I know you are the expert on that. Um, so how does a school closing create new opportunities for, for others? Well, your last comment was a little concern going into this question because you talk about the adverse reaction to change. Mm -hmm. But right now the, 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 the market has three main things pushing against higher ed. One is the disruption of education uh, by technology, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's allowing new people into the market. Mm -hmm. um, the second is COVID. Uh, COVID has thrown a, a, a massive monkey wrench uh, mm -hmm. into things. And then, you know, in 2026, we have the enrollment cliff uh, to look forward to with less people throughout the country mm -hmm. going to college just because yes. of lack of population mm -hmm. uh, at that age group. So I think, you know, that level of disruption has caused a lot of schools either to fall into a financially weak position, mm -hmm. uh, and some, even as of recent, have, have closed their doors. Mm -hmm. uh, and so given this disruption, there's a lot of opportunity for partnership. And either that is coming out of urgency, meaning a school needs to close their doors, Mm -hmm. uh, and they, they have the time though. They, they, they know that they're a year or two off before that they, they are not gonna be financially viable uh, given some of the trends and they can act intentionally mm -hmm. about their future. And I think boards coming, boards and, and presidents coming to the understanding as far in advance as they can, mm -hmm. that they may not be sustainable is actually a strategic advantage because they can then find potential schools to partner with mm -hmm. that, will, that will help transition their students to. They can have the time to figure out what they're gonna do with their physical plant, which is one of, you know, which is most schools number mm -hmm. one asset mm -hmm. um, and, and allow that transition to happen in a very methodical and strategic way over a, a year or two or even three, if they're mm -hmm. thinking far enough ahead. But if they're under the gun and there's a lot of urgency um, and they, you know, schools may have waited too long uh, mm -hmm. or just they, they got hit with such an enrollment dip that they couldn't recover from, right. uh, they may not have that long-term window to act intentionally. And so they're gonna be thinking through um, how do we partner or how do we, how do we approach other schools? And that mm -hmm. approach can be done in a very specific manner uh, that will ensure maybe some cultural alignment or even assessing uh, how things would be handled as part of the deal integration. And so there's a lot of that happening, not only in the nonprofit space, uh, but in the, in the higher education space. And I think we foresee more of that to come over the next five years, given these three main levels of disruption. But I think the plan is, just as you would have succession plan for a, C, a president uh, or a, a board chair, you should have a level of planning in place for either 
a school approaching you and how you would react to that if you're in a strong financial position or how you would approach a school if the enrollment cliff uh, you know, in 2026 is, is, is a, you know, a disastrous event uh, mm -hmm. for, for the organization or mm -hmm. if you know, the current climate has affected you that much. You know, wait, waiting to plan is, is, is not a smart idea and you know, there are ways to think through what the options are. And so right. you know, I think we'll see a lot more of the mergers, the affiliations, the acquisitions uh, within the next five years, just given the climate we're in now and about to enter. Right, and we've got five years till 2026. So why would why, they need to get that change mindset going? Yeah, and, and, and I think that's a good theme uh, mm -hmm. to, to kind of wrap up the discussion on is, is change in that schools need to do what they historically have not been strong at doing. And that is be very responsive, adaptive and flexible mm -hmm. and drive the ability to change. Right. Uh, and, and I think, you know, Rebecca, as you know, that's one of our kind of core value propositions is helping drive that change. Mm -hmm. um, because sometimes it's hard to do uh, when you're doing it internally. Right. Or by yourself. Right. Sometimes yeah, you need right. a fresh set of eyes, especially to convince faculty and staff that it really needs to happen. I mean, some of them have holes in the boat and the boat is, is starting to sink a little bit. It's taking on water and it's a matter of how are you going to fix it? Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's, it's a complex environment and, and I definitely can empathize with the, the presidents and what, what they are, are faced with as well as the boards. I think that, you know, one of my, my recommendations strategically would be, you know, to really get hyper-focused and focus on one or two things. Mm -hmm. Maybe three being the, 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 you know, the ceiling of organization-wide activities because, you know, in, in this state of affairs, you know, to, to really be successful, if you're focusing the entire institute or organization on one or two particular areas, that's going to increase the chance of success over having, you know, a diluted plan that may be focused on five, seven, or even, you right. know, God forbid, 10 things at once. Right. Well, they say people can't even concentrate on more than three things at a time. So, you know, 10 is, yeah. Yeah. My, in my coaching with, with staff, I tell them pick three and um, press the metal, you know, go as fast as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's great. No, I, I appreciate you taking the time to talk today. Oh, yeah. about I, this I appreciate you having me. This is wonderful. I hope we've helped somebody along the way. Well, I, I mean, we'll, we'll find out if you want to connect and learn more about some of the solutions in higher ed, please feel free to go to curtisstrategy.com uh, where you can connect with Rebecca and I. So Perfect. thank you. Thank you for watching and we appreciate it. Thank you.